Thank you to our praise team. You guys always do such a fantastic job leading us into the throne room of God. It's been a, a definitely a, a different week. My emotions have been all over the place, and my lesson has been scrapped several times based on what was happening, ebbs and flows. But uh, I wanted to share that the day before the election, Michael Barone from the Washington Examiner put out an interesting piece entitled, America is two countries not on speaking terms. And Barone kind of uh, made a case that not only is America divided, but the course that's going on is getting further and further polarized. And that uh, basically what we're choosing to do, if you look county by county, is we're choosing to surround ourselves uh, with the America that we prefer, and then we're ignoring the other America. Well, this morning I have no intention of talking about politics, but I want us to, to think about, and, and my prayer is that we're not doing the same thing as Christians with those that need the gospel. And I, I, I pray that as we interact with people that, that think and, and act and, and have a, a different moral compass than, than we do, uh, I hope for the sake of our calling of Christ. Uh, that we learn how to converse and to connect with people that come from a different background. That's what I'm hoping for. Let, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Lord, sometimes it, it's difficult. It's difficult when we encounter people that we just don't understand what their value system is based upon. Lord, when, when they see life so differently than, than we do. Lord, I, I just pray that you help us. Help us to be those that don't join in this uh, separation in this United States. But Lord, help us to be the ones that stand in the gap. Lord, as Paul encouraged us in Ephesians chapter 5, I, I, I pray that we will realize that the days are evil and we'll make the most of every opportunity. Lord, as we look at this story of the woman in the well, I, I pray that we can, can ask the question of, of what we're supposed to get from this passage. And, and Lord, even how that, that you connected with this woman. But Lord, I also pray that your spirit will ride upon our hearts as we're talking about these things. Who? Who it is that, that we're called to go to. Who it is we're called to reach out to. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in, in John chapter 3, we have the very interesting story of the ultimate insider, Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a, a Jewish male, a member of the Jewish ruling party. And, you know, he, he was an insider, a teacher of the law. He, he was someone that, that was well-versed in, in scriptures. And, and my, uh, my guess is, is he also lived a very moral and upright life as, as a Pharisee. And so he comes to Jesus at night, and Jesus was very familiar with the world that Nicodemus grew up in. He understood the, the passage and, and understood where Nicodemus was coming from. And so it's almost like a, a very natural conversation that he's having with his teacher of the law as he sits down with him and, and he, he tries to explain the gospel message of God's saving love. And I, I, I can just almost hear him, him talking and saying, you know, Nicodemus, I understand that you're a Pharisee and you're living out of this whole workspace righteousness. But I'm calling you to see your relationship with your Heavenly Father differently. And I, I want you to realize that a time is coming where you're going to be called to be born again and born of, of the Spirit. It's going to be a totally different existence than what, than what you, you've understood. And you're going to see that your heavenly father cared for you so much that he would send his one and only son and so we have the powerful message john three sixteen. for god so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever would believe on him is not going to perish but have everlasting life i mean if you had one verse you see it in football games if there's one verse to sum up what god's about it's here in this passage well, can you kind of see yourself in that situation talking with other people that basically have the same values that they may not see things exactly like you do but you have some commonness there i i know i i can i, I talk with people from different faiths all the time 
And what I found is, is, is with those that believe in Christ, 85 to 95 percent of, of what we talk about, we have common ground there. But what do we do with John chapter four? What do we do about this conversation? What do we do about those that don't believe like you do? Or, or, or those that don't believe at all? How do we connect with those people? What about the person that's living openly immoral life and just doesn't seem to care? A person who has a totally different way of, of looking at life. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a, a, a different compass. And, and what we say is north, that they say is south. And likewise, north and south for us. How do we connect with it when we feel like we have no common ground? Well, turn with me to, to John chapter 4, and we're going to see how Jesus, the master, went after this person. Went after this person that we sometimes would, would think is unreachable. Let's, let's start reading in John chapter 4. We're going to read 1 through 6. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in, in fact, it was not Jesus who was baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Well, this is a really interesting passage. It says that, that Jesus, to avoid conflict, starts heading up to, to Galilee. And, you know, as you know, for those that have studied the, this passage for years, that you know, any uh, God-fearing Jew, the last thing they would do was to go through Samaria, but in, instead they would kind of make a beeline of, around it and, and, and kind of zigzag so that they, they wouldn't have to touch Gentile soil and somehow be defiled. But in Jesus and his teachings, he, he talked about the defilement comes from the inside of the cup. Don't worry about the, the outside. That, that defilement comes from what happens in our heart and, and spills out instead of what we take in. And so Jesus says, absolutely, we're going to go right through Samaria. And so they take the direct route and stop at, at, at Jacob's well. So the, the first principle or the, or the first step that we have to take if, if we're going to connect with, with those that, that the world says, I, I really don't know Jesus. I don't know that I want to. The first step that we have to take is we have to go to them. You know, I've mentioned in previous sermons that the church has kind of, uh, in the past few decades, has really bought into the whole attractional model of ministry. And the idea is, is to create a, a beautiful campus and, and to put top flight children's and, and youth programs in, in place. And, and, and stuff for, for young adults and, and fantastic programs and welcome centers and kiosks and, and guest parking and all these things that communicate, please come to us. And if you do, we value you as a guest. And by the way, if you are a guest, absolutely, we do value you. I, I want to get that out there. But the message that we want to communicate is we want you to join us. And while that's proved effective for encouraging Christians to hop from one church to another, uh, it, it really has done little to reach out to those that are unreached. Well, Jesus went to Sychar to make a connection. The text tells us he had to go. It, it was something that God put on his heart. And if you're a believer in, in Jesus Christ, you're in tune with what God's doing God is going to put burdens. God is going to tell you, go into that neighborhood. Uh, uh, go do this. This person needs to be connected with. You can choose to dismiss that, or you can say, perhaps God is, is putting something there. Like Jesus, I've got to go do this. I, I believe that, that God does that today. So it says that he had to go there and we need to go and meet people on their turf where they feel comfortable at, at a time that's convenient for them in, in, in a way that makes sense instead of asking them, 
I want you to come at a time where you're normally sleeping on Sunday morning and reading your paper and, and enjoying your family. I want you to give all that up and, and come and, and connect in this way. Now, we've got to go to them. We have to. So Jesus is worn out from the journey. And so his text tells us he takes a seat on the large capstone that, that's over the well there. Let's read on in John chapter 4, verse 7 through 9. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? And while his disciples had gone into town to buy food, and the Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews, John tells us, do not associate with Samaritans. Well, seeing the woman coming, I mean, he said, it, it would have made sense uh, according to what was custom, uh, even among the Samaritans and Jews, both had kind of the, the same way of, of interacting, that as Jesus saw her coming, and, and obviously she's there with a large pot, and she's got a, a vessel for drawing the water, what she's there to do, it would have been appropriate for Jesus to kind of stand up, kind of take about 20 paces back, allow her to do her thing, and then he'd like to return to the well, allow her to get out of the way, and there, but instead, Jesus does something completely different. He remains. Jesus stayed put, and he asked for a drink. The second step, if we're going to connect with people not like us that desperately need to hear the gospel message, we have to be willing to, to break down walls. You know, in, in addition to defying the whole s social taboo uh, of a man talking with a woman, you have a Jew that's talking with, uh, with this Samaritan. There, there's no way that they should do this. And it, it was not just that, that the Jews didn't like the Samaritans because they had intermarried, although that was a huge part of it. It goes much deeper than that. 300 years earlier, Samaria had kind of served as an outpost for the Greeks. And so they set up camp there and then ruled over the Jewish people. And the Jews never forgot it. That, that the people of Samaria had allowed the Greeks to come in and rule over them from their land. In fact, in, in uh, 128 B.C., they retaliated by going in and destroying the Samaritan temple on, on the top of Mount Gerizim. And so they go in, they said, if you're going to allow this to happen, we're going to respond, and we're going to hit you where it hurts, where you go to worship. Well, not to be outdone, a few years before the birth of Jesus, a group of Samaritans went down on the eve of Passover and they grabbed a bunch of, of human bones and they scattered them there in the temple courtyard, totally defiled the whole complex on the night when the most sacred day they're going to come for and celebrate Passover. They, they couldn't do it. That's how the, the relationships and this hate had developed and Legend have, has it a bit, bitter rivalry gotten so out of hand, a rogue Samaritan poisoned some trees on Mount Olives. It can't be confirmed, but they say that it happened. Okay, I made that part up. <laughs> but they hated each other. They hated each other. But they didn't stop Jesus. In fact, Jesus just walked right through that red light. And we've got to break through some barriers that have been uh, put up either by us or, or by others and we, we've got to walk through some stereotypes and we've got to get rid of some divisions that have been put up between Christians and non-Christians the next step is we have to do this in a humble way we have to remain humble you know in a brilliant move Jesus kind of presents himself as weak he kind of sits there and he says will you give me a drink. Can you help me? Daniel Niles says this in the episode. He was a true servant because he was at the mercy of those to whom came to serve. This weakness of Jesus was actually a strength. And this weakness of Jesus, we his disciples must share. This is hard because as Christians, we've been kind of taught we are servants and we do for other people. You sit back and allow us to show you how good we are. And let, let, let us do this. Let us share. But in, in a, lot of a lot of times, the way we do this, it affirms the strength of the giver and the weakness of the receiver. What we're trying to do, unintendedly, we're putting down those we're trying to do it 
to and and you're trying to help out. And and a a lot of times it's almost like we have what you need. And we also tell them, I have it together and you don't. It's a huge turnoff. We need to realize sometimes we now allow others to do for us. Because Jesus reverses this and he asks for a drink. He remains seated. He allows this woman to serve and affirm who she is and affirm her value. Several years ago, I took a trip to Africa and we went out to preach in, in the villages back in the bush. And, you know, I, I had seen Indiana Jones, the second one, the Temple of Doom, and, and, and some of the foods that they, you know, so that's what's in my mind. I'm going to have monkey brains, you know. And so, so I, I was really worried about what they were going to be serving us back there. And so I loaded up my backpack, not only with my Bible, but I also had some granola bars and peanut butter. Now, this was not to pass out. This was for me to kind of sneak behind bushes and eat, you know. And, and what was interesting is, is our host missionary saw me doing this and said, unpack your bag. I was like, but I've got to take my Bible. He goes, no, the food. The food, don't do it. And so I kind of you know, played it off as being pious. Well, they're poor, and I hate to take food from the mouths of these children. He said, if you don't eat their food, they're not going to eat your spiritual food. You've got to allow them to serve you. You've got to affirm them as people and what they can do for you before you can share what Christ can do for them. You know, if we're going to build relationships, sometimes we've got to allow others to do for us. John chapter 4 and verse 10, and then we're going to skip down to verse 13. I want you to see how this, this continues on. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, th- this is after he's received the water from her, and who it is to ask you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks this water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water that wells up to eternal life. Well, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here day after day to draw this water. So, so Jesus masterfully in this conversation starts with where she is and, and starts with her felt needs, which is I, I've got to have water to nourish me and, and my family and those that I'm drawing for. And he goes into her spiritual need, this living water, which she actually has to have, these real needs to satisfy and sustain her spiritual being. You know, for the Samaritans, when he mentions this whole gift of God, what I would imagine is, is, is this Samaritan is, is woman is, is thinking he's talking about the, the teachings of Mo, Moses, the Torah. You know, for, for the Jews, it, it was the law and the prophets. So to her, when he says, well, this guy is talking about the, the gifts of God. He's going to enlighten me from, from the scriptures. When he's talking about, you know, the, this ultimate gift from God. What he's going to show her, it, it's not just words. I'm here in the flesh. The suffering servant that was promised by Isaiah was told by God in Isaiah 42 and verse 6, I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. We already have a covenant. It was given at Mount Sinai. It's this law. The suffering servant is coming. He's going to be the embodiment of this law. Of what God intended, you're going to see it in the person of Jesus Christ. What does John start off calling him the Word? If we're ever confused about God's intentions by what we see in the New Testament or Old Testament, it's not going to be in contradiction to what Jesus said and how he interacted. A lot of stances have been made from Scripture that, especially in the spirit and how they're delivered, is totally different than we see embodied in the life of Jesus Christ. If you're confused on any matter, look how Jesus interacted with the people around him. He is the living embodiment of what God intended. He's demonstrating how much our Heavenly Father loves us. It's not a document. It reveals the heart of the gift giver. And now he stands before offering living water to change her, to nurture her, to sustain her from the inside out. 
You know, the text reveals that this poor woman had been married five times. Uh, we don't know if, if she had been divorced or had lost husbands or what, but she was now living with another guy. Why didn't Jesus begin there? Instead of all this living water stuff? I mean, couldn't he have led with, you don't know who I am, but I know who you are. And, and, and what part of Malachi 2.16 don't you get? The Lord your Father, he hates divorce. What's going on? Well, I guess we don't have to worry about that because you're not even married to this guy. He could have nailed her to the wall. He could have. He had her. Had her dead to rights. Finally, we have to remember that acceptance comes before change. A lot of times we reverse that. We want people to change in order to be ready to be accepted by Jesus Christ. And that's not what we see in Scripture. That's not what we should see inside the church. We simply can't get and, and allow ourselves to get caught up into issues that, that, that with those that we're trying to reach. Even if we're right, that this is tough. It really is. Because we want to draw a line in the sand and make a stand for what is right. And we need to do that inside the church. The church should be drastically different than what's going on outside. But Paul says, judge your brothers and sisters is what their actions are because they need to be a living embodiment of Jesus Christ. Don't judge those outside. Sometimes when we get caught up into issues, roadblocks go up and, and barriers are put there that it, it freezes us out from people we're trying to connect with. If we're sincere in our desire to seek the loss, we have to accept people where they are. This week, Tom Rainer released a very timely article entitled, What Non-Christians Really Think About Christians. And he's written a, a lot of an incredible uh, books over the years and a lot of what he's coming up with he said I, I've spent a lot of time talking with Christians and also talking with the other side of the aisle and, and talking with people that don't know Christ and so I'm very intrigued by what this group has to say because right now these two groups aren't mixing and so he says uh, the most frequent comment that he receives from those that aren't associated with the Christian believers is Christians are against more things than they're for. It just seems to me that Christians are mad at the world. It, it, that's not what I believe. But yet they're never going to hear the message of Jesus Christ if that's the message that they're receiving. I think what they're responding to is our stances on issues. Are our positions wrong? Nope. <laughs> they're right here in, in Scripture. And, but proclaim to an audience without a relationship to God, they become offensive. Let me illustrate it this way. Evelyn Christian, where I went to college, has always had a large population of international students. And it, it's really neat and, until it comes around to the holidays. You've got a month off, so you've got these students, and many of them can't travel back um, to, their, to their home country, and so they're stuck there. And so they're, the cafeteria is closed down. There, there's nothing to do really in Abilene. Sorry. Uh, and, and so you've got host families around Abilene, but also around the state that agreed to take these international students. And our family didn't sign up to, to host one of these, but I signed up to give a Chinese student a ride from Abilene to his host home in Dallas. And I, I picked him up on a Friday afternoon after my last final. It was about 4 o'clock, and... Uh, Abilene was already starting to look like a ghost town. Everyone had left for, for Christmas break. And after a brief introduction with this Chinese student, um, he asked me, how long is the trip from here to there, and when will the sun go down? So I was like, well, it's about three hours, and the sun's going to go down about six. He said, oh, no, no, this is not going to work. Uh, it will be dark before we arrive. And so I'm like, am I transporting a werewolf? I mean, what, what's going on here? What? What's the problem? He says, we'll have to wait until tomorrow morning to travel. I'm like, no, we're not. We're leaving right now. <laughs> and he goes, you don't understand. He goes, I have a very strict father. 
And it's a rule in our family for our safekeeping that we don't travel after the sun goes down. And so we were at an impasse here, you know, because I had agreed and signed up to give this fellow a ride, so I couldn't leave him because they'd track it down. Why did you leave this guy? Yet he refused to travel. And so I, what I was thinking is, look, I don't know you, and I don't know your father. So why am I being expected to live according to his rules? Finally, I explained to my new friend that as the sun was going down in, in our country, it was coming up in his father's country. And so he kind of thought for a minute, smiled, hopped in the car, and we left. <laughs> but isn't that what's going on in the world around us? We, we can't expect people to see life the way we do and have the same values and beliefs if they don't know us and they don't know our Heavenly Father. We, we've got to build relationships. We've got to have people in our lives that we're trying to connect with. But this woman and the woman caught in adultery in John 8 and Zacchaeus in Luke 19, Jesus had every right to condemn them for their actions, but instead he reaches out to them, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. Woman, where are your accusers? I'm not. He's not being soft on sin. Go and sin no more. But he's accepting them. He's taking them where they are. He says, let me introduce you to my heavenly father. You have this perspective of him. That's wrong. And I'm going to break through those misconceptions as to who God is. I want to show you and demonstrate his love. That should be what we're doing. And if we're getting caught up on issues, it, it's going to put up roadblocks where we can't proclaim what Jesus would have us to proclaim. John 4, 25. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Powerful. He said, the person that's been accepting you, the person that's been loving you, this is the person you've been waiting for. She immediately drops her water jar. I don't know if it was full or not, but the text says she left it. She went back. No longer was this her focus. She had something greater. She goes back to connect with her family and friends and says, the Messiah, the one we've been talking about, he's here. John 4 and verse 40 says, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. He stayed for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. She becomes first Gentile missionary. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Do we believe this still happens today? Do we believe that same power is at our access? Do we believe that people can encounter the life-saving message of Jesus Christ and be changed? I, I sure hope that we do. Sometimes when we get out there, we get inspired by, by stuff like this, and we get to thinking about this. And, but when we actually get out there, we're, we're fearful. We don't want to be rejected. And so when we're, the Spirit is encouraging us to take a step forward, we take a step back. And, you know, when we hold back from sharing and, and, and when we know that we should be bold, and Satan has convinced us that the person we're trying to connect with really doesn't want to hear this, so why should we do it? But we have to realize that we have a message the world is hungry for. Confession time. This week, Steve Krieger and I went to Dallas for a conference on uh, surrender. That was the title of the conference and the, the theme for the week. And so it's, it's all about discipleship and, and giving yourself completely to the Lord. And so Steve and I made the decision to uh, to cut the conference um, short a little bit. We didn't go to our final session on Friday afternoon so we could hurry back so we could be here for the live telecast that happened on Friday night. It's fantastic. You can get it online with, with Francis Chan and David Platt talking about discipleship again and evangelism. Okay, meanwhile, all for the last week and a half, I've been buried into John chapter 4 talking about the woman at the well. And so I'm reading everything I can. And I'm just inspired that, that people can connect with people that aren't who you would normally think would receive the gospel. So all this is going on. I'm just being convicted left and right. And so 
The only thing between these two events of what's happening in Dallas and what's taking place on Friday night is a two-hour flight between Dallas and Huntsville. I'm actually saying a prayer. Lord, I'm in 12B. Uh, look out for 12A because he's going to receive. And, and, and I just pray that you put someone there that is ready to hear this message. Steve is in, in 12C right across the aisle. So you can verify all this if you want to talk with Steve later. We're sitting here talking, and I was disappointed in who I got. He was a nice older gentleman from California, grew up in Pasadena, and made his mark and made his millions in commercial real estate. And he's retired to the Palm Springs area, but he still receives a monthly rent from 40 commercial warehouses and shopping centers around the Los Angeles area. Let's just say he's doing well. Uh, now he, he spends his time traveling. Uh, he and his wife do all kinds of things, and uh, he enjoys going hunting, going to USC football games. Not a bad life. And so, though I, I did share that I went to a seminary in Pasadena, we had that connection, and I mentioned that, that I'm preaching here in Huntsville, I, I didn't press the issue. I, I just kind of, I didn't ask him about where he was on a spiritual walk. And here's why. He was rich and successful. He was from liberal California. And the gentleman had it all. He was living the American dream. And so, even though I'd been immersed in the story about the woman at the well, I took a pass on this guy. I did. And I, I predetermined he would not be receptive to the gospel message. So, I, I pulled out my Bible, and I thought, well, I'll get caught up on my reading. And so... Yeah, I opened it up, and I'm in John, and he even stopped me when he saw that the title page said John. He goes, well, that's my name. So I'm like, good, I'm studying here, you know? <laughs> uh, when the flight attendant came on and said we were making our, our initial descent in, I started putting my stuff up, and John said, hey, you know that book that you were reading? It, is that the Bible? I said, yes, he goes, I used to read that uh, as a child. I said, would you have a copy of it? And he said, no, I don't. I said, well, please take mine. I said, I have to tell you, it's, it's one I take when I travel because uh, it was given to a teenager, but it, the text was, the cover was turned upside down. He said, that Bible's perfect for me because my life has been turned upside down. His throat got real tight. And his eyes started welling up. And this guy that had it all proceeded for the next 10 minutes to open up about how his daughter had died for AIDS, from AIDS earlier that year. And how his life just didn't make sense. And he didn't know how to handle his burden on his own. He said, I guess I need to start reading that. He talked about how that he grew up in the Episcopal Church and actually served as an altar boy. But when he became a teenager, he walked away from all that and didn't raise his family up to believe in God. And he said his family has paid that price. He's gone through multiple marriages and, uh, and, and to lose his daughter in this way. He expressed a lot of pain and guilt and disappointment. He said he feels estranged from God. And so I, I gave him the Bible, but I also gave him my card. And John, I, I hope you'll connect on, on this and give me a call because I'd love to continue talking with you. But I, I, I hope that that story and the story of the woman of the well, that the Spirit is convicting you that everyone that we've predetermined that isn't ready to receive that, that's not true. Everyone, no matter if they're successful or, or in want, they need to hear the life-saving message of Jesus Christ. They do. They're out there. And they need that message. And we've got to be a conduit for that. You know, guys like John are there. The question is, will we humbly go to them and pour out what Jesus has done in our lives? You know, when, when disciples came back and found Jesus there, and they had their food, and they said, uh, Jesus, would you like some food? He goes, I'm good. I'm like, where did he get food? I mean, we were starving there. He goes, no, the food I have is from my heavenly father. He had to go to Samaria. God provided him this opportunity. He stepped out there and made a connection. That's what he was feeding on. And that's what I pray we will feed on in our lives. 
May we make the most of every opportunity. Let's pray. Lord, I, my, my prayer today is that with this powerful story and, and some of the things that we talked about Friday night on the podcast through your servants, David Platt, Francis Chan, and others, Lord, that, that you'll just, you won't let our hearts settle down. Lord, that you'll keep opening it up and convicting us that we've got something that the world needs. But Lord, we've got to do it in a humble way. We've got to do it in a way that, that reflects the Savior that we follow. Lord, give us courage. Humbly share your word with those. And Lord, I, I pray that your spirit has been putting on the hearts of everyone here a name of those that, that we need to go and connect with. Give us the courage to do this. We ask in Jesus Christ.